just ahead on One Detroit. Hip Hop turns 50 this year, we'll take a look at the impact of the music genre in Detroit. Plus, Matt Elliott, president of Bank of America Michigan, talks about the future of business in downtown Detroit. Also coming up, the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers kicks off its 2023 season with a Black History Month event. And if you're looking for something to do in Metro Detroit this weekend, we'll have some suggestions. It's all coming up next on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bear paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Just ahead on this week's One Detroit. What does the future hold for downtown Detroit business? Matt Elliott of Bank of America, Michigan talks about the city's recovery from the pandemic. Also coming up, the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers is opening its season with personal stories centered on the theme CRT, Betrayal and Trust. And we'll tell you about some upcoming events and activities in the Detroit area this weekend. But first up, a celebration of hip hop's 50th anniversary. The message is in the art form, is rooted in racial and social justice, and chronicles the experiences and emotions of black and brown communities. One Detroit contributor and self proclaimed hip hop nerd, Bryce Huffman, reports on Detroit's connection to the hip hop culture and movement. You look at a Motown, right, which is where I would say Detroit hip hop starts. Okay. This is Piper Carter, a Detroit artist and culture curator. She co-founded We Found Hip Hop, an organization that empowers women in the performing and visual arts. Carter says to understand Detroit hip hop, you've got to first understand the impact of Barry Gordy and Motown records. He looked at all these very talented people who came from historic Black Bottom and the historic North End of Detroit and was like, hey, we can figure out a way to um, organize this so that we are, you know, creating these avenues for people, right? This then becomes a successful formula. The formula was so successful that Gordy took Motown out west to California in 1972. But by the early 80s, a new culture was emerging, one that Detroiters were more than ready for. Take me back to the beginning of your experience with Detroit rap music. What was the first song or first artist you can remember hearing? Well, the thing is, um, before it was actually a rap artist, the dance actually led um, in the 80s. So um, because hip hop, um, or hip hop culture at that time was actually a mixture of like the music of the times, which was, you know, could be classified as like R&B, like, you know, um, or like funk and soul. And then, um, and then like rap kind of like, it came in, you know what I mean? But it was like, it was all a part of, it was like a, an amalgamation, right? I think what, um, Hip hop culture kind of provided um, folks is I would I'm, I'm a dare say maybe more like a safer space to be an artist to be creative to be innovative um, that was something that was very important in hip hop in general but definitely in Detroit it was very important there's also techno emerging right which is a very um, I'd say it's a close kin in Detroit to Detroit hip hop because the same people who were going to all the hip hop things were also going to techno. So you'll notice in Detroit, people are very like techno and hip hop, hip hop and techno, because those things grew both out of like the underground 
um, the lack of music and arts education in schools, you know, the whole um, uh, post-urban renewal, um, you know, the destruction of neighborhoods and things like that where, you know, uh, independent arts uh, culture emerged through the young people, through the youth. In the 90s, a Detroit fashion designer named Maurice Malone opened a clothing store that became more famous for the open mic it held at nights. This was a space where artists could invent themselves on the mic, the hip hop shop. You've probably heard a lot of the stories about the hip hop shop, which is where, yeah, a lot of the, what we know of as Detroit hip hop culture, your Jay Dilla, your Eminem, your Proof, all that comes out of that. Through the 90s and 2000s, Detroit established its own signature sound for rap music. Up-tempo drums, dark and simple piano chords. These are the building blocks of producer Helleva and rap groups like the Street Lords and the East Side Cheddar Boys. At Capitol Studio in Oak Park, just half a mile north of Detroit, is Travis Pittman. He's a Detroit producer who goes by the name 4AM Juno. He's working on a song with Detroit rapper Lilo. He says the Detroit production style fits perfectly with what the city is all about. It's a city where people want to get money and hustle, so I think that fast-pacedness kind of just is in the culture, like moving fast um, and just trying to get to what's next, like whatever next level or what's next in the day. Like just get some money and do what's next, have fun. Even the having fun is still fast-paced, like really turned up and stuff like that. This sound, however, was confined to Detroit and a few other cities in the Midwest for decades. But recently, rappers like 42 Doug, T Grizzly, Babyface Ray, Sada Baby, and Icewear Vezo have been getting praise from folks beyond Detroit's borders, all while keeping the Detroit sound alive. Like you were saying, it's been really regional. So I think that the fact that everyone's hearing it now is like something new, something new and exciting. Juno has been recording music in Detroit for the past seven years. There's been a whole conversation about uh, other rappers from other cities kind of taking Detroit sound and style. What kind of pride does that give you as a Detroit artist, you know, someone who's really from here and is really in the scene? I think it, it means that we're doing something right. If other people want to um, emulate it or make stuff similar to it, or they must be somewhat a fan of it or they're influenced by it. The more recent Detroit rappers are able to get their music to bigger audiences than ever before thanks to the internet. Lilo, whose real name is Khalil Jewel, believes Detroit style is the new standard for what's hot in hip hop. We have like different artists embracing Detroiters and the Detroit style and it's kind of allowed it to breach places that it didn't breach before. It's hand in hand with the art scene, it's hand in hand with the sports scene or everything is touched by the rap scene, everything is touched by the Every, part, every aspect of Detroit is kind of this conglomerate, and you just got to look deep enough to see it. So I feel like being passionate about any part of Detroit's art world is going to lead you to the music. Lilo says he wants his music to bring awareness to the everyday struggles of Detroiters. Those struggles, he says, include crime and poverty. So instead of me providing ways of necessarily being able to stop these problems, instead I am a voice that people can empathize with and maybe see themselves in or if they have no clue about what's going on in my city. Lilo is still in the infancy of his career, but he knows he has a lot of opportunities ahead of him. He says seeing some of the biggest Detroit rappers finally getting shine after years of grinding gives him all the confidence he needs. With those kind of success stories in front of me, it's kind of like, how, how can you fail? With more eyes on the scene than ever before, Detroiters like Carter, 4AM Juno and Lilo are proud to be a part of the city's deep hip hop scene. Like Lilo, 4AM Juno is looking forward to what comes next in his career, especially bringing in artists from other cities who are fans of the Detroit sound. I want to eventually get some of those people in New York that I like their music on some songs with people from Detroit and just bring people together for real. And you can watch part two of the PBS documentary, Fight the Power, How Hip Hop Changed the World, on Tuesday, February 14th at 9 p.m. on Detroit Public Television. Let's turn now to our Future of Work series. The Detroit Regional Chamber's recent Detroit Policy Conference put the spotlight on the future of downtown Detroit. One Detroit contributor, Stephen Henderson of American Black Journal, was there. And he sat down with Matt Elliott, president of Bank of America, Michigan, and chair of this year's Mackinac Policy Conference to talk about the state of downtown businesses.
So let's talk about what we've been talking about here, which is uh, downtown Detroit and um, you know how it recovers from the pandemic. I keep saying that it's kind of six in one hand, half a dozen in another. Nighttime, it's it's not that different anymore. I mean, you go down there and, and there's a lot of activity. Uh, daytime, not as much. And I guess I, I have real worries about that. Uh, as a banker, though, I'm really curious about how you see uh, the recovery and, and sort of the, the, the key levers to pull to make sure we get back to, to where we were before. Yeah, you know, first of all, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that the world's different than, than, than it was pre-pandemic. Yeah. And so getting back to where we were before may mean Maybe something different, thing. you know? Yeah. Um, I, I do think though that Richard Florida, who was here talking about the new role of what downtowns are for, mm -hmm. was interesting and we're, as, a, as Detroiters, very well positioned that he said, it's, this isn't the central business district, he said central connecting district, yes, right. which he I think is it. a really great metaphor for what you and I see when we, when we are downtown, right? Yeah. Number one. Number two, I think that some of the things that we need to keep doing, you know, frankly are aligned with what we're doing at Bank of America to help drive economic mobility, especially in communities of color, but stay focused on things like health and health equity, because you, know, you can't be economically mobile if you're not healthy. Um, job reskilling and upskilling, so filling these gaps that we know we have between the skills employers need and, and the skills that are available. Um, focusing, and thirdly, on, on small business and helping drive that forward because that's going to help our downtown as well. That's the, all these small businesses are really key employers. And they also knit together neighborhoods, which is really important. Um, and then the last thing is affordable housing. You know, you've got to be able to have a housing stock that, that people can access. And that's one of our competitive strengths when you look at Detroit, and the city of Detroit and the state of Michigan nationally, is that we're an affordable place to live. Yeah, more affordable than other cities. At the same time, of course, people in the city who try to make rent and try to buy houses and tell you, look, it still, it still yeah. can be pretty hard. Uh, what about the lending environment uh, in the city right now and the role that that needs to play uh, in all of this? Well, you know, I was having this discussion with another banker earlier today. Yeah. Um, you know, doing home loans in particular in the city has always been difficult because of the appraisal issue. Right. You know, and that is a federal issue and we're not getting around that. But a lot of, lots of organizations, us included, have come up with some, I think, novel ways to help address that, that gap. And so we've got a, a program we call the, uh, the Community Loan, uh, Affordable Loan Solution. And what it does is it allows a first time home buyer, and that's the key, the key thing, right. to get into a home responsibly and sustainably with, with no down payment. So we provide a grant for the down payment essentially. Um, and what, what, what's interesting about that is that to your point, very often the mortgage payment is far lower than the rent. Yeah. You know, so it actually saves the homeowner money, helps them build wealth, helps us with the housing stock in the city and you know, we win a client. So you know, yeah. from our perspective, that's a true win-win. Are you optimistic? Are you bullish on the city of Detroit and, and its recovery, not just downtown, but the neighborhoods, which, you know, the lending environment there is, of course, really different from, yeah. uh, from downtown, both in a residential and a commercial sense. Yeah, I think you can look at any situation and see, um, you know, what, what the issue is or maybe what the problem might be, yeah. but also what the opportunity is. Yeah. And I'm still, and I think a lot of people who are here today are still squarely in the opportunity camp. You know, that there is a lot of opportunity for us here. Um, one of the things that I, it was a data point I found the other day, which was interesting, is the Department of Energy came out and said, the three states in the country best positioned to drive uh, battery manufacturing, and uh, uh, Michigan is one of the three, right? Which we know we need to win in that regard, but that's going to create jobs, that's going to create opportunities, and lots of suppliers around that. So these are just other examples of, of what Richard Florida said, which is the world is tilting in Detroit's favor. Yeah. And when was the last time we said that? <laughs> Never. <laughs> it's been a while. Not in my lifetime. Uh, so let's uh, look forward a bit to, to May and yeah. Mackinac Island when you're going to be the chair of the policy conference. What do we have to look forward to? This well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to talk about what we call the power of and. And that's what the theme of the conference is. So often, Stephen, you know this, like well, people will come at an issue or come at a problem with a set of either or choices. Yeah, right. But we frequently- And then fight about the or. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you end up doing is having a discussion around being right, not find, not trying to get it right. And that's what we want to shift the conversation to do, is how do we, how do we put some things into, into maybe some tension yeah. that we realize that if we really work through them together, we get to the best and. So things like sustainability and economic growth, 
you know, making investments for the future but still being fiscally responsible, using equity, diversity, and inclusion as a growth strategy. Yeah. So yeah. some of these things that we're going to talk about, um, I'm really excited for. When we have, uh, you know, there's a, there's a committee of, of folks and advisors sure. around, you know, the chair and the CEO of the chamber to advise it. And when we start talking about this theme, we've got a lot of enthusiastic response. And so I'm looking forward to the, to the conference. The agenda is really shaping up nicely and it's going to be fun. You can see all of our Future of Work reports at OneDetroitPBS.org. And make sure to join us for our Future of Work virtual town hall, focusing on the Generation X workforce on Wednesday, February 15th at noon. Now, a preview of this year's opening event for the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers, led by Satori Shakur, host of Detroit Public TV's Detroit Performs, live from Mary Grove. The season opens on Friday, February 17th with a special Black History Month performance at the Southfield Pavilion in partnership with Southfield Parks and Recreation. Satori sat down with two of the storytellers, Yusuf Shakur and Reverend Horace Sheffield III and City of Southfield Administrator Tanisha Springer. So our first storyteller, I ask, in one sentence, what does black history mean to you? The Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers has been partnering with the city of Southfield Parks and Rec for about four or five years. What are the range of the stories? Every year the themes are different. This year is trust and betrayal. You know, black history is a lot of things. It's it's a lot of things. So when you come, you're going to come and you're going to hear something about maybe a topic you hadn't even thought about or may not have correlated with black history. And the storytellers are telling true personal stories. Yes, they tell their own personal stories. They're funny, sometimes they're sad, but they are from the heart and they touch your heart. And sometimes you can hear the story and it might make you think about something that happened in your family, in your past, or even in your present. The stories are always amazing. And my mother realized from that day that I was possibly going to get killed or kill someone. And she made a decision only a mother would make. She made me a ward of the state. And I remember asking her, why, mama? And she replied simply, to save you from yourself, my son. What does it mean for you to have a platform to tell your story at the Secret Society of Twisted Storytellers? Um, I've been doing this over. 20, 20 something years, right? Um, I don't come out of a traditional place. Um, actually, I recognize myself as an unorthodox person, right? I've taught my, been self taught. And the, so the opportunity through that process of a platform such as uh, Twisted Story, what I know is, is how, you, how you and your platform honor particularly black folks and black stories. They sat me down, they said, son, says, the only time in life you experience friction is if you're moving. If you ain't going nowhere, folk don't mess with you. So I went back and I gave them, you know, peace of my mind, told them F you, and uh, got kicked out of school. My mom said, what happened? I said, I gave them some friction. Well, I tell a story, I tell a story every week. <laughs> so, you know, effective forms of communication is a powerful thing. I mean, you think about Frederick Douglass. Uh, for example, in Cleveland in the 1800s with 1,500 folks in, in a hall being able to command the attention of all 1,500 of those people. And I think we, we've always lauded and honored people who have great oratorical gifts. The question is, and that's what I ask myself even when I preach on Sunday, as a consequence of what I'm saying, what do I want them to do? Yes. You know, what, Move, what's the touch takeaway? and inspire action? Right. What's the what's the behavior? What's the action? Yeah. Um, and if if I don't know that, then I'm just getting up, taking them on a trail that leads to nowhere. People are going to just be bowled over by your story, especially honoring mother, honoring father. But my thesis is around the relationship between me and my mother. So my my assertion is to overstand my oppression. I must overstand my mother's oppression. Uh, so I, look, looking at the world through my mother's lens. And I think uh, one of my propositions is for black people to understand our overall oppression is to understand the oppression of black women and how that has impacted us. When, I, when we talk about CRT, right, and, and the race dynamic, 
it matters. But then there's something else that I've been introduced to, which is triple, what's called triple oppression, race, gender, and class. And sometimes CRT doesn't necessarily it, it engages that, right? And it comes out of our own lived experience. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the lived experience of my mother, I see the beauty, I see the hope, I see the determination, despite the oppressions of uh, anchor that's trying to hold her down. And I mean, if we think about all our families, right? Unfortunately, we come out of poverty, but as if poverty is our fault. Poverty is the fault of society, the power dynamic, but then our mothers make the best of it. You know, that food that, that ain't got too much in the, in the refrigerator, right? But she go out there and whip some st something together. Mayonnaise <laughs> sandwiches. <laughs> you know that, but it's that love. Yeah. It's that hope. Mm -hmm. And she may go to bed, not, didn't eat. My, my being is a result of those sacrifices. Our being is a result of those sacrifices. So why I can't, why, why I can't honor my mother? Why I can't honor our women? Because again, th and then I think that's the missing piece in the CRT. So that was love number two. And again, imperfect love, you know, was met with imperfection. I, I want to really talk about how we locate uh, who we are within ourselves as opposed to all the social adjustments that are made on a regular basis. Jim Crow, slavery, there's going to always be something, uh, not just based on race, but even based on gender, based on zip code, that wants to relegate us to some subordinate position. He's untrue to me. How do we juxtapose so our own disposition? When you put this, the individual stories and a narrative, it makes sense. Like, oh, there's connected. And that's the, 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 the what allows for the audience to relate and see themselves to not maybe want to tell their own story, but also just to feel empowered within the framework. And I think this was powerful about the dynamic of telling this through, through a black, black History Month. And when people come to the event, and it's uh, February 17th at 7 p.m., uh, kind of walk us through what they'll experience when they first come in. They can come to the pre-glow, which starts at 6.30. And then there's vendors there, um, black-owned businesses. We have a bar set up. They can have a drink, relax, talk. Um, there's a DJ playing the jam, so you know it's a it's really nice ambiance. There are dance performers. You have their drummers there, um, yeah, vocalists. So yeah, along with the storytellers. So you're getting a really really good show. I mean, this is really just a coming together of the arts. Let's take a look at some of the other events and activities taking place in the Detroit area this weekend and beyond. Cecilia Sharp and Peter Worf of WRCJ 90.9 FM have some suggestions on interesting places to visit and fun things to do in today's One Detroit Weekend. I'm excited about what we have cooked up for this weekend. Mm -hmm. We're going to start with the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. They are celebrating Detroit jazz with the legacy of Detroit jazz, honoring Detroit musicians who have made an impact on jazz, not just here, but beyond. And also all month long is Southfield Public Library's Black History Mystery. For Ooh. the whole month of February, what you do is you go to the youth desk, get your instructions for moving through the library with all the clues to solve the black history mystery of the day. So that's happening at the Southfield Public Library through the month. And if you'd like, you can head over to Palmer Park in Detroit, where we're going to celebrate a winter fest with black history and love from 2 to 5 on February 11th. Nice. So talk about love stories, too. At Orchestra Hall, the Princess Bride in oh. concert. Yeah, so you get the love story, the movie, and the music live from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra on Valentine's Day, the 14th, and also a performance on February 15th. As we keep that theme of love going on February 10th and 11th, the Livonia Community Theater has Don't Hug Me, a love story. So keep the romance going with that play. Sky Covington will be at the Dirty Dog Jazz Cafe, a phenomenal Detroit jazz singer. That is a performance that you do not want to miss at the Dirty Dog Jazz Cafe. Fantastic atmosphere, delicious food. <sighs> yeah. 
I love the dirty dog. Love those duck fries. Oh, yes. <laughs> <sighs> Pretty great. I have to stay away from them, but they're so good. And speaking of great food and great jazz, Baker's Keyboard Lounge. Oh, yeah. I mean, a world institution every Friday and mm -hmm. Saturday. You may know about Ralph Armstrong and his trio. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we are related. <laughs> They perform every Friday and Saturday night, and of course, that's throughout the month. Ralph Armstrong Jazz Trio. Check them out. Well, that wraps up our events and our look at this weekend and beyond. I'm C Sharp from 90.9 WRCJ. I'm Peter Wharf. Have a great weekend. That will do it for this week's One Detroit. Thanks for watching. Head to the One Detroit website for all the stories we're working on. Follow us on social media and sign up for our weekly newsletter. From Delta Faucets to Bear Paint. Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.